In this section, I'll introduce you to the basics of investments. This includes some of the most important definitions and processes. I've decided to break up the section into four different videos. In the first video, I'll mention the four most important topics that I'll be covering throughout the semester. Then, I'll cover the most basic definitions in investments and the business cycle. Then, in the next video, I'll cover careers in investments. In our third video, I'll cover the basic characteristics of prominent asset classes like stocks and long-term bonds. And then, in our final video, I'll discuss the investment planning process and the life cycle for individuals. There's an old rule in public speaking where you tell your audience what you're going to tell them, then tell them, and then finally tell them what you just told them. In that vein, I'm going to tell you what you're going to see time and again throughout this course. First, we're going to see that markets are somewhat efficient in the real world. Since you've already had a class in finance, you've hopefully heard of efficient markets. Well, in this class, you'll see evidence that in the U.S. and developed markets, the valuation of assets like stocks and bonds adjusts based on new information. This is the basic idea behind market efficiency. Prices adjust based on all relevant information. In other words, a share of a stock's value should be based on all the available information we have on that stock's future cash flows, discounted to the present. Next you're going to see that there are a couple of different types of risk. We'll talk about two types of risk in the middle of this class, market risk and firm specific risk. Market risk is the risk that affects all securities in an economy. For example, a coronavirus outbreak will affect all stocks in the US. How that coronavirus outbreak affects stocks will depend on many different factors, but one of the most important of these factors is the amount of market risk the firm is exposed to. For example, firms like airlines are known to carry a large amount of market risk, so they would be more negatively affected by a decline in the U.S. economy. Speaking of performance and market risk, you'll see that there's a positive relationship between market risk and returns. In other words, firms that are exposed to more market risk are expected to offer higher returns. The reason for this is that market risk is the one risk you can't diversify away. Therefore, you as an investor should be compensated for holding stocks with a greater amount of that market risk. You'll see throughout this class that one of the best ways to reduce the risk of your portfolio is to diversify it across several different assets and several different economies if possible. When you diversify, you reduce your exposure to the risk of a firm-specific piece of bad news. For example, if you had all your money in Enron stock, you would be exposed to a large amount of Enron-specific risk. By holding other stocks in your portfolio besides Enron, and let's say only investing 5% of your portfolio in Enron stock, the most you could lose if Enron had an accounting scandal is probably about 5% versus the entirety of your portfolio if you were only investing in Enron stock. Now that you have a sense of what I'm going to show you over the course of this semester, it's time to make sure you're comfortable with some of the definitions I'll use throughout this course. Fair warning, this is easily the most definitional video you'll see throughout this course. I do apologize for that. I hate covering definitions because it is a bit dry, but just bear with me. Some of the later videos do get a little more exciting. <laughs> okay, first, an investment is any asset into which funds can be placed with the expectation that you'll generate positive income and see an increase in the value of the fund. This can include shares of stock, bonds, a piece of rental property, or even a painting if you're holding it with the expectation that it's going to increase in value or generate positive income. A portfolio is just a collection of different investments. It could be two different stocks or a painting and a bond. Diversification occurs when you hold different types of assets in a portfolio. You can diversify across stocks and bonds, real estate, etc. You can also diversify your portfolio by holding different stocks. You can hold Berkshire Hathaway and Apple stock, for example, or you can hold U.S. stock and Chinese stock. Finally, a return on your investment is your reward for investing. There are two ways to generate a return. First, you can earn income on your investment. For example, if you hold a long-term bond, it's going to likely pay you coupon payments. If you own a piece of rental property, you should hopefully receive rental income from your tenants. If you sell either of those assets for more than you bought them for, 
you are said to earn capital appreciation. In other words, the value of your assets increased during the holding period. When your assets decrease in value during the holding period, this is referred to as capital depreciation. We often break down assets into securities and property. Securities are financial assets. They provide their owner the claim on specific real assets or other financial assets. The key issue here is that you can't touch securities. I mean, I guess you can touch the paper that a stock certificate is written on, but in the real world, we, we typically just go ahead and say that securities are intangible. You can't touch them. Property, on the other hand, is a real asset, meaning it is tangible. You can touch it. Real estate, a piece of property, or a car are all real assets. They're all property. One big issue with property and other types of real assets is their lack of liquidity. Now, I'm going to mention liquidity a several times in this class, so I think it's better to just go ahead and define it. Liquidity is one of the most important topics in investments. It's the ability to buy and sell assets quickly at a fair value. So let's say that you need to sell a house this week and you know that the fair value of the house is $200,000. However, there aren't many people who would be able to buy that house from you within one week. Therefore, you might have to sell your house at a discount in order to make the transaction happen. This would be a perfect example of an illiquid market for your house. So you might have to sell it for $140,000 instead of the fair value of $200,000. Now, as a counterexample, let's say you own shares of Apple stock and you want to sell them in the next minute. So Apple's stock is a security. Uh, the current fair value of Apple stock is, let's say, $300.00. And to sell your shares, you might need to sell them for $299.95. Apple stock as a security is much more liquid than any real assets, any property. You can sell it more quickly at a close approximation to its fair value. The next definitions we have are direct and indirect investments. Now, Direct investments are investments that are made by an investor themselves. For example, if I buy 100 shares of Ford stock, that would be a direct investment. I made it. However, if I buy shares of a mutual fund that uses my money and the funds contributed by a bunch of other investors, and it takes that money and buys up 100 shares of Ford stock and holds those shares in the fund's portfolio, that would be an indirect investment. All right, let's try a question based on the material I just gave you. As I mentioned at the start of this course, I'm going to introduce you to some CFA level one questions throughout most of our lectures just to kind of keep things a little fresh. So let's start with a simple one. Which of the following is least likely a real asset? A, currencies, B, commodities, or C, real estate? Well, I think it's pretty obvious that real estate is a real asset. Uh, you can touch it, it's something you can feel, I mean, you can live inside real estate, a home, an apartment. Commodities, you can also touch those. Commodities, as you hopefully covered in your intro to finance course, those are just assets like oil or corn. You can touch them, you can feel them, you can uh, have way too much of them on occasion and know where to store them. Uh, so the correct answer here is A currencies. And the reason currencies is the correct answer here is because currency is typically defined as financial asset. Yes, you can have hard currency, you know, cash, uh, dollar bills or yen or yuan, but quite frankly, a lot of the currency that's being trans uh, transferred internationally is done so electronically, digitally. So quite frankly, the answer here is A. All right, now let's talk about the individuals and organizations that you'll see in the investment marketplace. First, we have financial institutions. Financial institutions are organizations that pool capital, or cash, to invest it in assets. Some of the most important financial institutions are investment companies, commercial banks, savings banks, investment banks. Uh, there's a bunch of other players in this industry, but those are the big ones. Uh, insurance companies are financial institutions that receive the premiums from the individuals or the organizations that they insure, combine the, those premiums, which come 
basically in the form of cash or capital uh, with money that they've borrowed. So the, the insurance company might issue a bond or they might borrow money from uh, another financial institution. And it's going to pool all of that capital and then invest that capital in a portfolio of stocks and bonds and other assets. And that portfolio will earn the, in, the insurance company a return on its investment. Commercial banks are just banks that receive deposits from individuals and organizations and then combine those funds with cash that the, the commercial bank has borrowed and then lends all of that money to companies or individuals in the form of loans and invests the rest in stocks and bonds. So for example, let's say you are a business owner in Terre Haute, Indiana, and you need a business loan for a million dollars. You would go to a, a bank like Terre Haute First Financial Bank, which is a commercial bank, and they might offer you a, a line of credit for $200,000, for example. Next, we have investment banks. And investment banks are banks that raise capital from depositors, and they also borrow a large amount of money. However, their primary activities have historically been helping firms and governments raise capital by issuing debt and equity. Investment banks can charge these organizations fees for their services. So for example, let's say Apple needs to raise a billion dollars for, for a new iPhone that they're developing. Well, they can go to an investment bank like Goldman Sachs, and Goldman will help them issue new shares of stock or a new bond issuance, and Goldman will take a certain percentage of the, the funds raised. And lastly, we have investment companies. Now, investment companies is kind of a term, uh, it's a, it's a catch-all term for investors that manage clients' money. This term encapsulates organizations like mutual funds, hedge funds, pension funds. There's a couple other types of funds, but those three are going to be the big ones. Now, investment companies are often referred to colloquially as institutional investors. Throughout this course, I'll be referring to those investment firms or investment companies like mutual funds as institutional investors. You're going to hear me uh, refer to that term or that phrase almost in every single lecture or every single section. Institutional investors are a little different than individual investors. Uh, so if you or I invest shares of stock, we would be considered individual investors. Uh, sometimes we refer to individual investors as households. Now, there are a lot of other market participants out there besides financial institutions and individual investors. For example, there are private equity investors. Uh, these are investors that focus on investments in firms whose shares are not publicly traded on a stock exchange. There are two prominent types of private equity investors, venture capital firms and angel investors. Venture capital firms provide funding to new and private firms in exchange for shares of stock, and they often receive a seat on the board. Angel investors are high net worth investors that typically take an equity stake in a new firm in exchange for funding. The best example of angel investors would be the sharks on the show Shark Tank. If you've ever seen the show, you know that there are several wealthy individuals listening to pitches by entrepreneurs who are seeking funding. The sharks on the show, aka the, the wealthy investors or angel investors, they're there to make bids for the company. They're essentially offering the company capital for an equity stake in the company. And a lot of times angel investors will use their connections to existing businesses or businesses that they might own uh, to help out the, the new company. Finally, firms and governments are two market participants that are often seen as seekers of capital. These market participants need capital to fund their operations. Firms need capital to pay for new equipment or the inputs they need to produce inventory. Governments, on the other hand, often need to borrow money to pay their military or build roads. All right, I have a couple more definitions for you. First, let's talk about capital assets. Now, capital assets are assets that are owned by taxpayers. These assets could include real estate or shares of stock or some other type of asset. A capital gain represents the amount by which the proceeds from the sale of a capital asset are more than the original purchase price. 
Capital gains are taxed in two different ways, depending on how long a taxpayer owns the asset. Uh, so let's say that a taxpayer holds the asset for less than one year. Typically, they're going to be taxed on their capital gains at their ordinary income tax rate. If the taxpayer holds the asset for more than a year and then sells the asset for a capital gain, they're going to have to pay the capital gains tax rate, which is often lower than the taxpayer's ordinary tax rate, and therefore it's in the taxpayer's best interest in some cases to hold an asset like shares of a stock for at least one year if they're going to sell it for a capital gain. Now, a capital loss is the amount by which the capital asset depreciated in value during the investment period and you don't pay any taxes on any capital losses. All right, the final topic I have in this first part is on the business cycle. Now, hopefully I haven't bored you too much with all the definitions, uh, but before I wrap up this video, I wanted to show you the business cycle. Now, the business cycle reflects the idea that economic conditions cycle through expansionary and contractionary periods through time. During expansionary periods in the business cycle, we see increases in gross domestic product, industrial production of goods, and disposable income. We also expect to see a decrease in the unemployment rate. All right, let's take a look at a poorly drawn graphic. So here's a graphical representation of the business cycle. So on our y-axis, we have GDP or gross domestic product. On our x-axis, we have time. So as you can see, as we move forward in time, we have this period of expansions and contractions. And as our GDP increases, we see obviously an economic expansion, economic conditions are very good, and right here we have the peak. And at that point, or from that point, all the way down to the trough, or the, as it's sometimes known, the nadir, that is referred to as a contraction or a depression, if you like. Uh, so the economic definition of depression is just two consecutive quarters of negative GDP growth. So this is generally what the, the business cycle captures. Now, if you want to see some of my favorite videos on the business cycle and why it exists, then go ahead and click either of these links. Uh, it's, I, I, hopefully you won't be disappointed. I love these videos and I, if, I, if there was time, I'd show them in a class every time I could. So let's recap what we covered. I'll skip the four most important concepts from the beginning of the video since you're going to see those time and again and I just wanted you to see those uh, immediately. Uh, first, I discussed several types of assets like real assets and securities and securities are often more liquid than real assets. Second, we discussed market participants like institutional investors, individual investors, angel investors, and firms. In the market, firms and governments are frequently seekers of capital, while individual and institutional investors provide that capital. In other words, they're investing in the market. Next, I mentioned that a positive return can be achieved in two ways, through an income you receive by holding an asset and from a capital gain received when you sell an asset for more than you paid for it. Finally, I showed you the business cycle, which indicates whether an economy is in an expansionary or a contractionary state. I hope you grasped all of those concepts and I'll see you on the next video.